Hello everyone and welcome to the Tradcast, the podcast that connects traditional archery enthusiasts. Today is episode number 13, and on today's show, I'll be discussing the secrets of frost seeding with Teddy Clark of North Ridge Wildlife Forage. This is going to be a very informative show. Let's jump right into it. All right, everyone, welcome to this week's Tradcast, the podcast that connects traditional archery enthusiasts. Today is episode number 13, and I've got another awesome show in store for you guys today. In a few moments, I'm going to break over to a recent interview I had with Teddy Clark, the owner of Northridge Wildlife Forage, and Teddy and I discussed some very key aspects and key components to frost seeding which is an excellent way to not only establish new food plots, but to keep those existing food plots healthy, fresh, and attracting deer. But before we get to that interview, I just want to give you guys a couple of quick updates. The first update being our weather. I mean, as you guys can see, we've still got uh, quite a bit of snow here in northern New York. In the woods, we've got, I would say, probably maybe a foot of snow, or maybe just under a foot of snow. And the weatherman is forecasting temperatures actually all next week to just slightly break the freezing mark and actually a few days we're going to be below freezing so we're not going to have any major snow melt this week I don't think so I think we're probably still looking at at least two to three weeks before we're going to be able to get out here in northern New York and do our frost seeding but I know in other places around the country the snow has already been gone for uh, for a few weeks now the ground is starting to dry up And this is an ideal time to get out there and get your frost seeding done if you want to either establish new food plots this year or, like I said, keep those existing food plots uh, looking healthy and keep them fresh. So that's the first update I had for you guys. Um, I just wanted to give you guys another reminder. If if you'd rather listen to the podcast in an audio-only version, you can do that on either podomatic.com or on iTunes. And if you simply search the Tradcast on both of those outlets, we should pop right up and you should be able to subscribe to our Podomatic channel or to us on iTunes. So that's a way you can listen to the podcast in an audio-only version. And uh, another update I had for you guys is I've because of our snow, I'm still pretty much restricted to indoor shooting. And uh, I've been continuing to shoot my longbow every day. I've shot every day. I've got a little 10 yard range in the basement. I just keep shooting my bow every day. And I'm just working on my release techniques, my draw techniques, and my sight and my visual sighting techniques. Because I'm a I'm learning to shoot fully instinctive. And I just continue to work on those aspects of my shooting. And as soon as our snow finally breaks. And I can get outside and start shooting without the risk of losing a lot of arrows. I'll be getting out there and doing that. And one last update for you guys. Today I'm actually headed up to my property. I'm going to be checking a couple of trail cameras that I've had out in the woods now for for, uh, pretty much all winter. And I've got a couple of areas where I've had deer passing through the last several weeks. So I wanted to come up here today, check those cameras and see what's been going on this past week. And I'm also going to be refreshing a couple of mock scrapes that I maintain. And I don't maintain them on a year-round basis. And the only reason why I don't do that is because, you know, up here, pretty much January, February, the first half of March, we just get so much snow that it's not practical to try to keep a mock scrape um, freshened. Otherwise, I would keep these freshened year-round. The last several years, I've had great results at you know pulling deer into these mock scrapes and getting their pictures and getting and you know and getting these deer to repeatedly visit these mock scrape areas so i'm going to come in here today refreshing a few of these mock scrapes because now that now that spring is finally here our snow should continue to melt 
and we shouldn't get any additional snowpack from here on out. So I'm going to start refreshing these mock scrapes and start, you know, getting deer accustomed to visiting these areas, which is going to be great for getting trail cam pictures this year and also be a couple of great hunting locations for later on this season. So I'm doing that today. But uh, now, without any further ado, I'm going to jump into the recent interview I had with Teddy Clark of Northridge Wildlife Forage, where we discussed some very key aspects and key components to frost seeding. I hope everybody enjoys this interview. I know I certainly did. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a special guest on the line tonight. I am interviewing Teddy Clark, the co-owner of Northridge Wildlife Forage, and Teddy and I are going to be discussing the secrets of frost seeding. Welcome to the show, Teddy. Hey, thanks, Chad. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, I appreciate you taking the time to uh, be on the show tonight. Now, Ted. Food plot all the time. <laughs> yeah, same here. <laughs> now, Teddy, you are the co-owner of Northridge Wildlife Forage and for anybody listening tonight who may not be familiar with your company I wanted to have you just uh, tell us all a little bit about Northridge Wildlife Forage how the company got started and the current goals of the company oh great all right thanks Chad well Northridge Wildlife Forage started uh, officially uh, about two years ago uh, myself and Mike Novick are the owners, and, and honestly, Mike Novick is the mastermind behind all of our blends, so i got to give him a shout-out. Um, it started when, about 14 years ago, Mike was really unimpressed with the results he was getting from food plotting. He was buying these big commercial blends, and he just wasn't getting the results that he was after. Um, and, you know, we started, he, he started thinking about it and realized that, well, you know, a lot of these blends are designed for the Midwest. And as we know, here in the Northeast, you know, northern New York, New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, we just don't have the same climate. We don't have the same soils um, that they have in the Midwest. So Mike started saying, okay, well, this plant grew good in that blend. So we started kind of picking and choosing what was really, um, what was really thriving in his food plots. And then he started doing a lot of, research and seeing what had really good palatability to uh, white-tailed deer specifically. Um, and he started coming up with some blends uh, that were doing really well. So anyways, make long story short, Mike got brought on to PA bow hunting, an online group of hunters, and so was I as team member for PA bow hunting. And that's how Mike and I got to know one another, and that's essentially where the idea um, of Northridge was born, and we just kind of started rolling from there. Uh, what we've got is we've got some high-end food plot blends designed specifically for Pennsylvania and the Northeast U.S. Uh, they're designed to thrive here, and they're also designed to not just grow well in this particular climate, but they're designed, every seed is hand-selected to have the absolute best qualities, um, in Mike and, um, and mine's opinion, uh, for white-tailed deer. Uh, kind of what we do, that's, that's our goal is to constantly try to make a new blend or to find a new seed that may not be a well-known seed, but a new seed that's going to have some really great qualities uh, for the wildlife in the area. So we've got three blends, Chad. We've got a perennial clover. It's made up of five different clover seeds. Um, it's got some hybrids in there. It's got a lot of whites, a lot of New Zealands. It's called mountain monster clover. We've got a brassica mix uh, made up of three different turnips, some hybrid turnips, um, four sets of traits. Groundhog radish, and it's designed to not just give those bulbs that everybody really likes in a turnip blend or a Nebraska mix, but it's designed to have a whole lot of sugary greens on top that are made to withstand a heavy browsing. So the deer can come in and wipe those tops off, and they're just going to come right back. We also have a no-till blend, um, essentially a throw-and-grow blend. You know, you just get it out there for those hard-to-reach areas. Uh, but we got rid of the number one ingredient in most no-till blends is ryegrass, and we got rid of it because ryegrass will grow anywhere, but the deer don't eat it. So we replaced the ryegrass with rye grain, a winter rye grain. The deer can digest rye grain. They actually prefer it over many other food sources, and it's just as aggressive growing as ryegrass. And then we added some turnips and some other things to our throw-and-grow mix and and, uh, you know, found a mix that's really aggressively growing, but also palatable and uh, nutritious for the deer. Awesome. Well, it sounds like you guys got some great blends. Yeah, thank you. 
Yeah, we're, we're proud of them, and uh, so far we've, uh, they've been received really well from our customers, and, and people have really enjoyed them. So. Yeah, I, I can imagine. Um, now, Teddy, I wanted to frame our conversation tonight around the idea of frost seeding food plots in the springtime. You know, since it is springtime and a lot of guys are starting to think about, you know, their food plots. Um, for anybody out there listening tonight who may not be familiar with the term frost seeding, um, what is frost seeding? Frost seeding is a really easy way of maintenance for a clover plot. A lot of people will buy clover and they see on that bag that it's safe. You're going to get three to five years longevity out of that clover blend, and you will if you properly maintain it. And one of the best ways to maintenance a clover plot is to frost seed it. And all frost seeding is essentially is going out and broadcasting seed onto an existing clover plot during that early springtime, Chad, when the ground is freezing at night but thawing during the day. Because that freezing and thawing action causes the ground to essentially gobble up and eat that seed that you broadcasted. What that does is it gives you optimum seed to soil contact. So then when it warms up and we're in the middle of the late spring, your plot's going to come in really nice and thick and lush. Right. Now, uh, now, Teddy, for anybody who wants to maybe do some frost seeding on their own food plots, uh, you know, rather it be maybe starting a new food plot or establishing or, you know, maintaining an existing food plot, um, could you discuss some of the advantages um, that you can see from doing uh, frost seeding? Yeah, absolutely. The biggest advantage you're going to see in frost seeding is what you're going to have is a clover plot that doesn't come in patchy. Because what happens, um, a lot of clover blends are made up of multiple different clovers, different types. And some of those seeds will start to fade out after, say, year two or year three. Um, so what you're going to have, if you don't frost seed, you're going to have a, path, or a, a plot that grows in patchy. And those patches where the clovers are starting to fade out are going to be overtaken by weeds. So now we'll say maybe you, year two or year three, 70% of your plot will be clover, 30% is going to be weed. Well, I don't know about you, but I'd rather 99% of my plot be clover and only 1% be weed. You know, they're going to be fresh and young, and they're not going to be fading out. So your plot's going to be nice and full and thick. So it's really a two-edged sword. You're keeping your plot full of clover, and you're also helping keep the wheat out of your plot. Now, no clover plot is going to be free 100 percent. It's just it's unrealistic. But if you don't frost seed, you're going to start seeing more and more patches of weeds and grass kind of infiltrate and start growing in the middle of your clover plot. Yeah, that's a great point, Teddy. Um, I know you know I've been doing frost seeding myself on my food plots for the last. Uh, Oh, I'd say three, four years, and uh, one of the reasons why I like frost seeding is because it's a way to get those seeds into the ground very early spring, and this way here, you can actually allow those germinated clover seeds to actually kind of now get into a position where they can kind of out-compete the weeds and, you know, get those clover seeds ahead of the weed growth in the springtime. Uh, I just wanted to have you maybe touch on uh, on what your thoughts on that are. Yeah. Chad, you're absolutely right. Uh, by frost seeding, you're beating the weeds uh, to get to that open ground. Um, it's an easy way. It's a really easy way, simple way to get seed to soil contact. That's the number one rule in food plotting, really, is you've got to have good seed to soil contact. So frost seeding is really great because it's a super easy way. It's a really simple way to broadcast seed out of the ground and you really are beating the weeds, we'll call it open real estate. You're beating the weeds to that open real estate in your plot, and the, because the clover, you're getting it there earlier. So clover seed's going to germinate. As soon as it can germinate, it will, and it's going to grow up, and it's going to essentially fill up that open real estate before the weeds ever have a chance to get there and germinate. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, now, I also wanted to have, you know, while we're talking about, uh, you know, beating the weeds, in the springtime, um, I wanted to have you also touch on Teddy what your thoughts are with uh, with using herbicide as a way to uh, to maintain your clover plots. Well, it's a great way to maintain it. You know, um, what I like to do is also mowing. Mowing and, her and herbicides are, are a great way to beat the weeds. Also, beat them down in a plot. What you're doing by mowing, essentially, what I like to do is when my plot gets about fifty percent white flowers in it come back nice and tender and sweet and it's going to bring the deer right back into it. 
but it's also helping distribute some clover seeds. So it's basically helping your clover reseed itself a little bit there. And another thing it's doing is you're mowing down all the weeds, and you're mowing down those weeds before they have a chance to get full grown. Once the weed gets full grown, Chad, it goes what, what we call it goes to seed. And once it goes to seed, it's going to disperse those seeds throughout your plot, and now you're going to have a lot more weeds growing. So mowing is a great way um, to keep the weeds in check, and it's also really good for your clover to mow like that. And if you add that with uh, spraying some herbicides, they've got some stuff out there on the market today um, that won't target clover. It'll only kill broadleaf weeds. So you can pick up some of that. I like to buy the cheap version of it at Tractor Supply, and I don't remember the name of it now um, off the top of my head, but it works really well. Um, and it will it will definitely take down the weeds, and it really doesn't even stop the growth of your clover. Um, so there are some really good products out there for that. Yeah, the one thing that I've learned uh, from doing clover over the last several years is uh, when it comes to a clover food plot, you're pretty much going to get what you you know, you're going to get out of it what you put into it. You know, the more work that you put into that clover plot, you know, with the maintenance, with the frost seeding and the mowing and the and, and maybe the one time a year herbicide application, you know, the more effort you put into that clover plot, the better results you're going to see from it. So, um, and, you know, clover is, uh, guys ask me all the time, you know, hey, if you could only plant one plot on your property, what would you plant? And I got to tell you, hands down, it's clover. Because you're absolutely right. If you put time and energy into your clover plot, it will continue to amaze you uh, year after year, day after day. And what I really like seeing is clover's got some really great protein levels in it. Um, so what you end up seeing in the time, Chad, is you're going to have a lot of does coming in there with their fawn, and they're going to be eating that clover because it's really giving them a lot of protein into that milk for their lactation on there that are suckling. So that's really neat to watch. It's really neat to experience that. With a good clover plot, you're going to see a lot of that. And in turn, in hunting season, I don't know about you, but I don't necessarily go after a target box that I have on trail camera. I like to hang my stand where I've got a high concentration of does because that's where the buck will be come fall. So if you've got a clover plot and it's bringing does in all summer long, all you know June, July, August, and September, you've got a lot of does in there. Well, come October, that's where the bucks are going to end up being. They're going to be paying a lot of attention to those areas where those does are really concentrating. Yeah, I agree, Teddy. Uh, you know, I, I definitely see more deer activity, you know, throughout the year on my clover food plots than I do on any others because, you know, they just, they grow for, you know, so many months out of the growing season. I mean, you've got clover up from pretty much, you know, early May right through until the snow hits. And you're not going to see that a lot of, you know, much out of your fall plantings. So, Clover has certainly been my go-to planting here in uh, in northern New York. And um, now, Teddy, I also wanted to have you um, explain to the listeners. Now, I know there's some environmental factors that you want to, you know, look for before you start thinking about doing your frost seeding. Um, could you touch on what these environmental factors that you're looking for are? Absolutely. Um, the main environmental factor is snow. You want to wait for all the snow to be gone. What happens if you try to frost seed while there's still snow on the ground? Your seed is exposed. It's not necessarily going to freeze your seed. What's going to happen is it's not going to get to the dirt. And so the birds are going to see it. A lot of your seed is going to get picked off by the birds. And then another thing that happens is the sun's going to hit that snow. It's going to melt it, which is going to um, essentially, it's the same as raining on top of the seed. It's going to cause that to germinate, possibly. When that seed germinates on top of the snow, um, it's just, um, you're pretty much good to go with. Like I said, it's a really simple, easy thing to do, frost seeding. You wait till the snow's gone, and basically as soon as the snow's gone and, and all the heavy uh, water that sometimes is associated with that, you know, if the snow melts really quick, you could experience even some flooding, water in it, um, or even running water on some plots. I know I've got a clover plot that's on a slight hill, and so when the snow first melts, I don't want to frost seed because some of that water is still running off, and it's essentially just going to carry the seed with it. So you're just throwing your money away. Um, so, you know, you want to make sure the snow's gone. You want to make sure there's no standing or running water in the plot. Other than that, as soon as it's ready to go, um, that's really environmental factors that you have to worry about. Yeah, that's a good point. Now, the one thing I will add to that, Teddy, and it's it's one thing that I've that I know we get them here in northern New York, and uh, one thing I will do 
is you know like I said once that you don't want any standing water in the, in that food plot because like you said you're just kind of wasting your seed at that point but another thing that I'll do is I'll watch the weather forecast you know and I'm and I'm going to basically make sure that the weatherman's not calling for you know some sort of a you know torrential downpour type storm in the next you know week or so you know I want to have at least you know for myself I like to have about a week to a week and a half period of time where it looks like you know there's not going to be any real major weather fronts coming through which might also have an impact on you know washing out that food plot on you hey Chad I'm glad you brought that up about uh, wanting to look for any kind of extreme weather coming in the extended weather forecast because that doesn't just apply to frost seeding but that applies to all seedings um, I like to go by a 10 day roll of thumb uh, say I want to seed on day one but seven days down the road we've got calls for a heavy thunderstorm well I'm actually not going to seed because what's going to happen you're going to drown those seeds or essentially wash them away with the heavy rainstorm so you actually want to watch that and be mindful of that at any type of planting, especially any type of food planting, food plot planting, any time of the year, really, you want to watch that extended forecast and kind of give yourself a 10-day uh, window of opportunity there, a 10-day period where, you know, if they're calling for a little bit of rain, that's not an issue. A little bit of rain can actually be good. I actually like to plant right before a small rain if they're calling for 40% chance of scattered showers. I, that's right when I like to seed because that rain will actually help germinate a little faster and it's going to help kind of drill that seed down into the soil a little bit. Now with frost seeding that's not a big deal because that freezing and thawing action is already essentially sucking that seed down into the soil so you don't really need that for frost seeding um, but you know for any other type of seeding I actually like to uh, I like to seed right before a light rain but if they're called for heavy rain absolutely I don't want to seed I'll actually wait till that weather system has come and passed. Yeah, I brought that up because I've actually fell victim to that a few times. Um, you know, I just think everybody has. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think if you food plot long enough, you're probably gonna gonna run into that no matter what the weatherman's saying. But I just know myself a few times I've kind of gotten ahead of the game, and you know went out and did some seeding, and come to find out they were calling for some pretty nasty thunderstorms a day or two later, and pretty much had a pile of washed up seed in one area. Yep, yep, and then you just kind of go do all the work again. Yeah, so that's definitely something I thought that uh, that was worth bringing up. Um, Absolutely. Now, Teddy, um, I also wanted to have you um, touch on um, the best seed types um, for frost seeding. Okay. Uh, the best seed types for frost seeding, really, in my opinion, there's only two different types of seed to frost seed. One of those being any type of clover, basically, okay, uh, your New Zealands and your whites um, will particularly frost seed very well. Uh, a lot of, lot of seeds will, you know, all the seeds that we have in our clover blend, Mountain Monster Clover at Northridge, that's a really great blend for frost seeding. It's very cold hardy, it's very cold hardy seed, so you really don't have to worry about um, any, really any clover seed getting damaged by that colder temps at night. Because uh, clover seed itself is very uh, very cold hardy, so that that works well. And the other seed that is good to frost seed is chicory. Uh, chicory is a really good seed to frost seed, um, and it's actually a really good seed to mix right in with a clover plot. As a matter of fact, I mix it into all of my clover plots. Um, and, and the reason being is chicory um, has got some really good protein levels too, just like just like clover does. But it uses uh, up the nitrogen, okay? So it uses up some nitrogen there, which is good because clover really doesn't. And uh, also, clover is not very drought resistant. So in the middle of the summertime, if you've got a couple weeks where it's been really hot and really dry, your clover is going to start to essentially go dormant. It's going to start to look a little patchy. It's going to start to look maybe a little wilted. But your chicory has got a really deep tap root. So what that does is that taproot from that chicory plant gets way down into the soil and it's pulling up moisture that the clover just can't get to. Uh, so it's going to stay, it's very drought resistant, so it's going to stay very nutritious, very palatable to the deer in those hot summer months where your clover may actually dwindle a little bit, your chicory is going to do really well. And the last thing is that deep taproot also brings up a lot of nutrients from the deeper soils and we'll distribute them into the clover roots then. So you're actually, uh, it's really good for the clover that's growing next to it as well because it's bringing up a lot of nutrients. Yeah, that's a great tip, Teddy. I know I wanted, I actually do want to um, add some chicory to my 
um, established clover plots uh, on my property as well. Um, yeah, you, you know, for it's a really really good plant to add with with clover. It actually makes a really good standalone plot. I just am planting a new food plot this year at uh, a family of my family's property in Clarion County, Pennsylvania. And I'm actually going to do my first ever standalone chicory plot. I'm not actually going to do chicory and clover. I'm just going to do straight chicory. Um, for for the reason being, it, it's it's essentially a, a, a clover. It's got a really high protein level, um, and it's also very resistant to bugs. So it's got a waxy coating on the leaves that doesn't bother the deer, uh, but it does help keep out some bugs. It does help keep out um, some disease. So it's just a really hardy plant. But the ground that I'm planting up at my camp is I'm out on top. It's it's got a lot of shale. So I'm afraid that it's going to drain very quickly. I'm afraid this soil is not going to retain a lot of moisture. So that's why I'm going to try chicory up there this first year and see how it does. Um, and I, it's a little more drought resistant. This is going to be some pretty dry dirt. So um, so that's why I'm going to be doing chicory up there. Very nice. Um, now, Teddy, another question I had for you that I wanted to have you uh, explain for everybody um, listening yeah. is I wanted to have you go over... Um, some of the net, some of the equipment that you can use for frost seeding, and I wanted to have, I wanted to have you kind of give us, um, kind of uh, a high level look at how you go about uh, frost seeding. Okay, absolutely. Uh, it's one of the great things about frost seeding. You actually don't really need any equipment at all. All you need is a broadcast seeder, uh, whether it's a walk behind Scott's grass seeder. Um, that's what I use for some of my plots. Um, or sometimes I like to use the old school uh, broadcast seeder, which is just stuffing my hand in a bag of seed and throwing it out by hand. <laughs> so it's really simple enough. If you've got a larger plant, you might want a tow behind seeder, broadcast seeder, but I will also use a rake because a lot of times what happens in a, your plot, if it's a wooded plot around the edges, you may have quite a bit of leaf cover on the ground. And like I was saying earlier, seed to soil contact is really important. So you might want to take a garden and kind of get those leaves that fell in the fall, kind of get that brush there. You really are down to bare dirt, and you have to do so. As long as you've got a cedar and a rake, you're able to frost seed. And that's all I ever use is a garden rake and a walk behind cedar, and that's how I do my frost seeding. Very nice. Yeah, all I've ever used is a, um, and actually I've had really good results with it. I think I'm on like my fifth or sixth year with it, is I actually have one of those, uh, it's one of those Earthway uh, red, you know, shoulder cedars. Um, yeah, absolutely. A lot of guys use those too. Yeah. Yeah, I just I I like that cedar because it it's very heavy duty. I mean, I actually broadcast you know lime fertilizer everything with that, and it just when I'm doing my seed, you know, especially, it just really seems to just give a really nice even you know seed distribution when I'm using that cedar. That's great. Yeah, and another thing, Chad, a lot of guys. Um, we'll like to use the lime, put the lime right in with our seed and kind of broadcast it all out at the same time. And that's a wonderful idea. Um, essentially, at least in Pennsylvania, uh, the, the soil pH is usually pretty low. So throwing some lime out there, you can never go wrong with lime. So, <laughs> you know, uh, that's typically what I do whenever I frost seed. I also usually dump in some dolomitic or pelletized lime. Uh, and I spread that right out with the seed because um, that's going to really help germinate. And, it's, and, and what happens is if the pH is too low, it's going to kind of stump that growth. So if you can help lower that pH, really you're, you're going to help that seed, you're going to help that new plant have really good, really quick, really fast growth. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that, that pretty much you know, answers that. Um, you know, the next question I had for you. I was going to ask you if there's any other steps or any other you know, considerations that a guy wants to think about when he's doing frost seeding. And I agree, I think it's, it, it's, I mean, almost, getting down that lime is almost as important as the seed itself. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. pH level is very important. To All right, Chad, uh, another thing I want to recommend doing is taking a soil sample from any of your food plots. Now, you can do this any time of the year. What I like to do, I know in, Pen or in Pennsylvania anyways, most of the soil sample kits are from any of the local mill stores. You can go out and get a soil sample kit. They're, they're $12. Um, and what you do, you dig up a, a few patches of dirt, mix it all up, put it in a bag, and you ship it on out to the local university or whoever uh, you know is, is running the uh, soil sample there. 
what they're going to do is they're going to come back uh, and they're going to tell you, because on that sample kit, you're going to tell them what you're trying to grow, whether it's clover or whatever. And they're going to come back and they're going to tell you what your pH tested at. So that's a really great tool to have to go into the spring or summertime knowing that, okay, I need to run a 52626 fertilizer and I need to put down a ton of lime per acre to get the proper pH and to get the right nutrition levels into that soil. Because then you can do that at any time. Even if your seed is already down, your food plant's already growing, you can still fertilize lime. And you're going to notice after the first rainstorm, you're going to notice almost an immediate response from your food plot. It's going to start, it's going to look different colors. Um, it's going to start being really vibrant. You're just going to notice just, just such a great difference in it. If you can get that pH and those nutrition levels just right in your plot, going to make it all the world. It's going to make a huge difference. <laughs> yeah, no question. I mean, uh, pretty much without a proper pH, uh, no matter what you do for seeding, um, your food plot's not going to succeed unless you unless you get that pH in check. So That's right. That's right. You know, one other thing, Chad, one other thing, um, I, I don't know if I touched on this before, with frost seeding, I recommend using a one-half rate. Meaning if you have an acre clover plot and it's already an established plot and you want to cross seed it, you don't need to put an entire acre worth of seed on it. So if you've got a one acre plot, you want to use a half an acre worth of seed. You know, at Northridge, we use eight pounds to the acre. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm sure that, you know, there's probably some different, you know, schools of thoughts on that. But, uh, you know, I, I certainly think that, you know, you don't need to put down, you know, an entire you know, planting with a seed, you know, to, to, you know, maintain that, uh, that plot with a frost seeding for sure. Absolutely. You know, if you're establishing a new plot, then yes, you do want to put down the recommended, the manufacturer's recommended amount of seed for a new plot. But frost seeding isn't really designed for establishing a new plot because you need to wait for that native grass or that native weed to grow so that you can spray it with herbicide or so that you can kill it, turn it, kill it give it time to die before you go and plant that clover seed on top of it. So frost seeding isn't necessarily designed for establishing new plots. It really is designed um, and it really is a great way to just maintain existing plots or already established plots. So you're right, you really don't need that full source of seed. Um, you're just going to essentially be throwing away some of that because there's just not enough real estate for it all to grow and survive. So what happens is, yeah, all that new seed will germinate, but then all that seed that's going to be re-germinating from the roots that are there from the last year's planting are going to come up, and you're just going to have too much growth per square inch or per square foot of dirt, um, and some of it is just going to essentially end up dying off. So you're really just throwing your money away if you go with a full rate of seed if it's already an established plot. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, now, one thing I wanted to add, uh, Teddy, it's, it's actually a, a, a technique that I've used on my um, on my plots uh the last couple of years and uh, it's a way it's a way that I found to establish um, a clover plot you know over a previous year's fall planting so essentially what I've done on a few of these smaller plots because I you know I've I've taken the time during the summertime to go in there and you know mow these down spray them you know burn off the existing vegetation and then I've planted in you know a fall planting you know that late you know that you know early to mid August and then what I'll do is the you know the following spring because I've already taken the time to you know get rid of all that old vegetation the previous summer and with the fall planting and that you know fall planting got you know eaten down but you know by the deer considerably so what I've right. done is I've gone in there in the spring on top of that you know previous year's fall planting and did my frost seeding of clover at pretty much you know a generalized rate of what you would of what you'd normally plant and I've actually had some pretty good results at getting clover to to establish on that previous year's fall planting by simply doing a frost seeding. Absolutely, and, and I was going to say that uh, that really is the only way that you can use frost seeding to establish a new plot is say you have a brassica mix planted. Um, you have a half an acre of turnips planted and you planted them in August. Well, you had to spray down and kill the original vegetation anyways. You turned the dirt, you planted your turnips, they grew. The deer came in all winter long, they ate them down, they dug up the turnips, they ate all the turnips. So now, you know, the snow's melted, you know there's no original vegetation growing there. You've sprayed off the original vegetation, and you already killed that the last summer. Oh, yeah. And then you know that fall annual you planted, 
Well, it was eating all fall and winter long, and then it's going to die in the wintertime anyways because it's a fall annual plant. It's not a perennial plant. So then you know in the springtime when you go to Frosty, once the snow is melted, you know that there's no original vegetation growing there because you had already killed it off last summer, and it didn't have a chance to reestablish because you had that fall annual growing there taking up all that open real estate. Yeah, that's a technique that I that I have had pretty good results here uh, on my properties anyways. Um, you know, I've just always tried to think outside the box when I do my food plots. Absolutely. You know, because you know, you know, we know, have... There's, there's really no golden rules. Like I said, the only golden rule in food plotting is you got to have seed to soil contact. If you want a plant to grow, you got to put that seed into the dirt. That's the only golden rule that there is. Yeah, I agree. And like when, like I, I know we have a very restricted growing season up here. I mean, where I'm at in northern New York. I mean, like I said, we don't. I mean, I would say our growing season, at best, is you know mid May through you know end of September. Yeah, yeah. And so that just makes food plotting all that much more important to the wildlife there um, to get that good food source in there, especially with the clover, getting those high protein numbers into those deer. Um, in that small growing season, and that's really going to give them the nutrition that they need uh, to really make it through those long, harsh winters that you guys have up there in northern New York. Yeah, they can be brutal, and I, and I, and I definitely agree that, you know, frost seeding is a great way to, you know, get ahead of that growth curve, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, especially if you've got a small growing season, you want to hit it, and you want to get your plot growing good right away, as soon as it can. So frost seeding also helps your plot really grow in nice and lush as quick as it can because you're getting that seed into the dirt right away. Before the growing season has even really started, your seeds are already there, ready to germinate. So as soon as that soils to the temperature that it needs to be, bam, germination is happening and your plot's really coming in nice and full. And it's really going to be able to take more of a beating then. If it comes in nice and full and it's getting browsed really hard by the deer, um, it's going to be able to accept that browse that much better uh, if you do that frost seeding and it comes in really nice and cool. Yep, I couldn't agree more. I, th I think frost seeding is, uh, is a very important thing that every food plotter should have uh, that trick in his bag. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, well, Chad, I want to I want to thank you guys, and I want to thank Vantage Point Outdoors uh, for having me on tonight. And I, I really look forward to uh, any more questions that anybody might have on this, or any food sort of plotting questions uh, in general. If you got any questions, ask Chad. Ask Vantage Point Outdoors. Um, they don't get the question that if they don't know the answer, but Chad's really knowledgeable, so he probably already knows. You can also look us up. We have our own Facebook page, Northridge Wildlife Forge. You can look us up there, ask us any questions you want. It's on our webpage. It's just simply our name. It's just NorthridgeWildlifeForge.com, um, and we try to make it as interactive as we can. So I look forward to hopefully hearing from a lot of people. Okay, awesome, Teddy. Yeah, I'll be I'll be linking uh, to your Facebook page and to your uh, website in the show notes. So anybody listening tonight, if you want to find out more about the Northridge Wildlife Forge blends. Uh, you can uh, check them out on those links, and um, if you have any questions for Teddy, you can uh, you can certainly uh, track him down at those avenues. Okay, thanks again for being on the show, Teddy. Thanks, Chad. I appreciate it. Yeah, we'll talk to you later. Uh -huh. Bye bye. Bye. All right, guys. Well, there you have it. Just a look back at my recent interview with uh, Teddy Clark about frost seeding. Frost seeding is a very important aspect of food plotting it's something that's easy to do it just takes a little bit of work in the springtime but it's really a great way to not only establish new food plots but to keep those existing food plots that you put so much time effort and energy into making it's a great way to help keep them fresh healthy and keep them attracting deer for several seasons I'm really looking forward to getting into my food plots here in a few weeks getting my frost seeding done and getting ahead of the curve on that growing season which is so crucial to food plotting especially if you're in a northern environment like I am here in northern New York we've only got I mean we've got a short growing uh, a growing season anyways you really want to maximize that especially with your perennial food plots by jumping out ahead of that growth curve and getting those seeds in the ground very early spring and the best way to do that is through frost seeding I've only got one last reminder for everybody. If you enjoy what we're doing here with the show, 
I would really appreciate it if you could jump on over to iTunes, leave us a quick review. It's a great way for us to, to not only expand our audience and get the podcast to more people, but it's also going to be a great way for me to continue to get new guests on the show so that we all can learn more about being better outdoorsmen, better bow hunters, better traditional shooters, and like I said, just better all around outdoorsmen. So if you enjoy what we're if you enjoy what we're doing, please leave us a review on iTunes. And I'm gonna see everybody right here next weekend on an all-new episode of the Tradcast.